Hello, thank you for joining us at the Bourne Awards Crafting Competitive Essays webinar. My name is Michael Saville. I work at Bourne. I've been here since 2005. Holy cow. Uh, but our my goal today is to give you some information on how to craft a competitive essay. Um, I have been through this process many times uh, as a uh, outreach uh folk person who uh, goes out and talks about this program a lot i'm also a former advisor and i've sat on numerous countless uh panels as a facilitator for the born and um hopefully i can share a little bit about uh something that could help some things that could help you with your essay uh this is going to be relatively informal <laughs> Uh, but we'll do our best. Some of it, I will. Uh, I will try to make sure you get all the information you need. If at any point uh, something is confusing or you have questions that are specific to your program, you can contact me uh, at boren b o r e n at i i e dot o r g, and I'll be happy to answer your question. Uh, this is a webinar that is for both um, undergrads and graduate students, so this is for everybody. In addition to viewing this webinar, we strongly recommend that all applicants review the guidance available on the Bourne Awards website. This is found at uh, bornawards.org slash essays. Uh, this page contains a lot of guidance on each element of the application essays, plus links to the career pages of dozens of US federal agencies, which will allow the applicant to research the important elements of essay two. So lots of information on our website. Uh, we don't hide what we're looking, <laughs> what we want you to tell us. Um, uh, the, the key is not just um, telling us what we want to hear, but making sure it relates to you. And, we're, and we'll get into that. We're going to talk about the webinar outline. So let's cover a few general tips uh, to make your argument uh, as clearly as you can. So although the Boren scholarships and fellowship applicants um, applications permit you to paste uh, and edit your essay directly into the application, uh, we don't recommend this. Uh, we strongly, strongly don't recommend this. Uh, what we rather you do is write this in a Word file, like in a Microsoft Word or Google Doc, uh, and save that progress. Uh, the website is on a timer, so as you're starting these essays, if you're doing it in the system, uh, every now and then you want to hit save to make sure you don't lose any any progress. So when you're writing your essays, naturally it takes longer, and you, you're you're giving yourself an opportunity to uh, lose all your work, which we don't want to do. Uh, it's also a good idea to share your essay with as many folks as possible. Uh, the more eyes, the better is what we always say. So the, your campus advisor, if you have one, um, professors, your academic advisor, anybody who reads your letter of, sorry, anybody who's writing a letter of recommendation for you, generally speaking, should get a copy of both your essays because they're gonna have an opportunity to talk about the, the, um, the significance of your program, the, the feasibility, all those things that's, that we ask. So th this is important as well. Uh, when you are, uh, when you are answering the essays, uh, you definitely want to answer the prompts. You know, um, you are going to if you are applying to the CLS, if you have applied to the CLS already, if you are applying to other programs, make sure you're not just recycling that from other applications. Um, you also want to avoid not, you know, creating your own questions and answering those questions. So. Uh, when you answer <laughs> answer our prompts, you're going to find 800 words is is uh, not enough words, right? You're going to 
you're going to run out of space if you start adding questions we didn't ask you. So be, watch out for that. Uh, so four to six paragraphs is roughly the size of these um, essays. So you want to you want to make sure you're using these um, judiciously uh, and use line breaks between paragraphs. So this is an HTML format. So a lot of if you just if you have a certain special format in your Word file, a lot of that gets you know um, changed when you cut and paste it into the into the um, application. You will be able to print out a PDF copy or look at a PDF copy of your application when it's all said and done. Um, I recommend that as well because you want to make sure that everything you copied and pasted fit and that you actually see the bottom paragraph. We get a lot, you know, we get a good chunk of applications every year and every now and then there seems to be like a missing paragraph or half a sentence uh, at the end of a uh, essay one or two and that doesn't look good. All right, essay number one, U.S. national security. So here we are giving you 800 words to explain the significance of your proposed country, region, and language to U.S. national security. Uh, I always emphasize U.S. Us. Don't forget that we are talking about U.S. national security. So if you're applying for Japan and you make this great argument why Japan is important and uh, it is important for Japan to do this, that, and the other, and, it, and you forget to mention the U.S., uh, that could get you in trouble. You need to make sure you're specific about why U.S. national security is um, is part of your argument. So uh, we do recognize a very broad definition of national security, but you need to make the specific, detailed, and focused argument. That's the prompt. That's all we ask you in this. It's very short, uh, but there's a lot in there. So uh, let's get into what we're actually looking for. So what is national security? Some of you are international relations majors. Some of you are, uh, you know, in, interested in um, political science. Maybe this isn't a difficult question for you to answer. But for some of you, you may be wondering, what do I need to put here? What What is relevant? Uh, well, of course, the normal ones we often think about, if you ask anybody on the street, what is U.S. national security defense is usually the first answer you'll get. Uh, or possibly you'll get diplomacy. Um, and 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 some people will say intelligence, and those are great. Uh, they're three of our major uh, components of our of what we look for in our public service uh, essay. Uh, but that's not it. There are a lot of other opportunities uh, to describe national security. You, you're not limited to those three. You could talk about economic development. Uh, democracy and governance, um, environmental, environment and sustainability, so environmental impacts, environmental sciences, um, food security and agriculture. There's an in, there's a um, there's a foreign service out of Department of Agriculture. Not everybody knows about uh, public health and disease prevention. Think NIH, uh, CDC, things like that. Uh, cybersecurity is a big one. I've spoken to many cybersecurity classes this fall. Um, at, on campuses around the country, and it's been very, very interesting to see. Uh, immigration, um, trade, commerce, financial regulation, telecommunication, Department of Energy, you know, energy is very interesting. We had a good story about fusion came out this week uh, that will date this. You shouldn't say things that date your uh, recording, but that one uh, just came out. Uh, and disaster response. Uh, USAID, FEMA, um, some of our biggest uh, employers uh, of Boren. So uh, that is just basically telling you so many parts of what is national security. And it's anything that protects or, and or promotes the well-being of the United States on the international stage. Right. That's it. That's the that's the uh, that's the definition, and that should help you uh, with what we're looking for. Uh, of course, you can hit this uh, QR code if you're watching this um, on demand, and, and it will take you to our essay one guide if you need to look at it over again. Uh, what we want you to do is make so think of your essay one as a think of this thought experiment. Uh, imagine that you're sitting across the table from a representative of Congress and and you don't know what state they're from you don't know anything you don't know their political affiliation you just need to uh, you need to you get five minutes you get five minutes to convince them of the public policy issue that interests you that matters to them their constituents 
in the United States. So you're basically, it's an elevator pitch. You're going to make this pitch to explain why it is important for what it is. And that five minutes is roughly that 800 words we're giving you to make this argument. This is the essence of the national security argument. Um, there are do's and don'ts. Um, we basically want to make sure you are making a persuasive analytical essay. Uh, for some of you who uh, haven't written a lot of essays, or at least um, you, you work more in the STEM fields, uh, you make sure that this is a uh, this essay is is flows well. It's not in bullet points. We get it every now and then we get some of you uh, science and STEM folks, uh, engineers who write it like an engineering diagram. So we try to avoid that. Uh, you want to make sure you're addressing that national security. Uh, argument based on your own academic and future career goals. This is very important. Linking your career goals, what you want to do in the federal government, which you'll talk about in detail in essay two, have some taste of that in essay one, have a link. One of the biggest complaints I heard in uh, the uh, committees last uh, last selection panel, uh, when we were doing selection panels last winter, was the essay one, even when it was a good essay, when they, when the, or at least when the applicant made a strong national security argument, often the committee would lament that the essay seemed to be adrift. It didn't connect to the rest of the application. So you have an opportunity there to connect it to the rest of your application by mentioning your future career goals within this essay. Um, you want to explain the relevance of your topic and to the interests of the US. This is going to be somewhere Let's say you're applying for Eastern Europe and you're maybe interested in, in studying in uh, Georgia or Tajikistan or something like that. And you bring up NATO and you talk about NATO a lot. Um, if you never actually specifically say the U.S., even though the U.S. is a big chunk of NATO, a big part of it, uh, it could definitely, the committee may say, hey, they never specifically mentioned um, you, the U.S. in their essay one. We are not going to fill, you know, connect the dots for you. We're not going to fill in the blanks for you. This is something we tell the committee not to do. Uh, if it's implied, that is not the same as being implicitly stated. So be sure to do that uh, and make sure that argument is cohesive. This is not a research paper. We do not expect you to, in fact, we do not let you put in footnotes or a bibliography or anything like that. Uh, you're going to make sure that national security argument, I gave you 18 ways you could make that national security argument, but you give me 18 ways, if you tell me 18 different ways in your essay, uh, you're not going to have time to make a specific argument. You're basically giving us that Wikipedia answer. Um, and, and you want to, you want to, you want to avoid that. Just stick to one, uh, stay in your lane, uh, and, and you'll get through this and, and, and it should be, should be a strong essay. So that's our that's our essay one, uh, essay two. This is also going to be about 800 words for the scholars, about a thousand for the fellows. We give you a little more room. Uh, we want you to discuss the following. Here are the prompts, and what I want what I want to emphasize here is giving equal attention to each point. Uh, wow, so many people. In, in fellows and scholars, uh, so many people will spend uh, 600 of their 800 words or 700 of their 1,000 words talking about that first prompt. Think about a previous experience that has led to growth of personal quality, reflect upon it, and describe how it will assist you in preparing to spend significant time overseas uh, studying a critical language, right? And if you're a fellow, this is why we add the, add the extra 200 words or, and it's, if applicable, conducting your pr proposed research. Now, this part is always very popular and people start writing and they're doing great. And then they realize, oh no, I only have 200 words left to f make, you know, f answer the next two prompts, which in reality are very important to the application because you're telling the committee uh, you are interested in federal work. You're explaining why you're interested, how, what you're doing why the born will help you get federal work. Basically, that is one of the key parts of this essay, a key parts of the entire application. And so many people just try to cram it into one paragraph. So avoid that, please. Uh, there are two elements. So the personal growth and preparation for overseas study and the plan and leadership qualities for federal government career. Um, 
You do not have to have studied or traveled abroad before. I want to emphasize that. For those of you who have never studied abroad, most Americans don't. Uh, most college students do not study abroad. It's 12% at best, um, and definitely we're nowhere near that right now um, post-COVID as we're crawling our way out of this. Um, I think we had less than 15,000 U.S. students studied abroad uh, this in 2022. We had about a million students from overseas come visit us, right? So you, it's not apples to apples, but at the same time, it is shows you this very low number of students who are studying overseas. Um, Think about the inexperience that shows that you're a mature person, that you understand the challenges uh, for of long-term international study. And, and that could include learning a new language. Uh, this may be a language you have no background in before. Uh, living and working with people from a different background, getting accustomed to unfamiliar culture and navigating a new environment. Uh, these are the things that we're looking for in that, in that part. Um, the uh this is going to be again just a part of your essay make sure that is roughly a third of your essay that you're when you when you talk about this part it's the plan and leadership qualities for federal government career this is where we're going um we're going to really launch into uh what it is what you want to do your ideal situation um if you were basically if you could pick where you work in the federal government this is what i would do and that and really that's going to be the gist of that part of your application of essay number two uh, what you need to remember is what is our pri what are boren's priorities uh, you know you're talking to a boren selection panel they are going to be interested in how you are connecting Boren's priorities with your career, with your career goals. So the preferred agencies are going to be important here: uh, the Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, Department of State, and the intelligence community. Um, when you actually are looking for work in the federal government, contracting with one of these agencies. I am technically a government contractor with the Department of Defense, so what I do would count toward um, my Boren uh, my service agreement if I had one. I did not know born existed when I was in college and I would have definitely applied for it. Um, but c'est la vie. So uh, if you zap that QR code, this is one of the good ones. And they, I've, I mean, they're all good ones, right? We made them, but in reality, this is one of the best ones. Uh, this will take you to a whole list of agencies and sub agencies and places where born have uh, worked. It's not a comprehensive list. It is a uh, kind of a snapshot of, uh, of a bunch of born uh, over a thousand born and it gives you an idea of where folks are landing. Uh, some of them will be very common and you'll see them in these four, but you'll see agencies within these mega agencies that you may never have heard of before. Uh, when looking at DOD, this is really so those of you who are, you know, in ROTC and you're heading to um, military uh, life after graduation, it's going to be great. Um, that's going to count toward your service, of course. Uh, but you, we'd also probably want to know what you plan to do post military. After you do your four years or six years, what are you going to do when you um, get out? Are you going to maintain? Are you going to stay in the military? Are you going to uh, transition into a civilian role. Uh, the, the DOD has almost a million civilian employees. The DOD is our highest, our largest employer in the U.S. Um, there are many entry-level jobs in the DOD. Uh, there are a lot of STEM careers in the DOD. So those of you in a STEM field can look into this. Um, if you're in computer science, look at DARPA, for example. Um, Homeland Security hires a lot of Boren. Uh, they have FEMA, Coast Guard, Immigration. Those are some of the biggest ones that hire Boren, and this may be something that you're interested in. They do have jobs all over the country. Uh, and you, State Department, of course, we get a lot of folks who are interested in being a foreign service officer. Uh, it is definitely a big part of the program, although there is a civil service as well. Uh, USAID, we put into that um, Department of State um, umbrella. Depart USAID has their own foreign service as well. Uh, if you're looking at the intelligence community, there are lots of opportunities, again, for STEM there. Uh, language specialists, um, many of the PhDs uh, uh, required positions. So those of you who are applying for the fellowship and you are in a PhD program, this would um, benefit you as well. So there are a lot of opportunities within our preferred agencies, which you really should consider writing about in your essay too. Some of you may already be 
interested in agencies outside of our preferences. So uh, agencies like the Department of Agriculture and Commerce, as I mentioned, uh, for ag, they do have their own foreign service. Um, there are numerous uh, bureaus and offices that deal with uh, transnational issues. Uh, the Department of Energy is, is another good one. Uh, Treasury Justice, Health and Human Services will be particularly interested in graduates with specialized degrees in engineering, economics, law, uh, social work. So all of these opportunities are out there. Uh, born alumni have gone on to fill administrative and research roles. Uh, in agencies like in NASA, CDC, Environmental Protection Agency. Um, service as a Peace Corps volunteer is definitely great. It will fulfill your board service. Um, we also talk about if you're interested in working for the Peace Corps, um, what explain to the boring committee what you plan to do post Peace Corps, similar how I ask an ROTC cadet who is going into the military to talk about their post-military plans. What do you plan to do when you leave Peace Corps? Uh, because two years is great. It will fulfill your service, uh, but uh, it isn't technically long-term federal service, which is one of the things we look for in a competitive application. So how will you dovetail this experience into working maybe in a um, priority agency like Department of State's USAID, um, something like that. Uh, so these are things that you want to think about. These are all tier two agencies. So all of these jobs, although born have fulfilled their service in these agencies, they would require an extra layer of approval from the government, from the NSEP, if you were to get jobs here. Um, so uh be careful when you when you are um talking about these agencies in the sense that i would like to see you know go into detail about cdc i have no problem with that go into detail about working for nasa but it's good to bring in a priority agency as well like space force uh under the um intelligence community uh if you're applying for nasa for example just things things to think about now sa2 we are asking you to create a basic uh career mapping um, again, you have roughly two thirds of your essay to, to talk about this. Uh, you're going to talk about maybe your short career goals, internships, professional development. If you are a freshman, sophomore applying to this program, you can talk about getting an internship while still at university. Uh, that internship, let's say you get a State Department internship, uh, that could chip away at your service. Uh, so you do a three month summer program between your junior and senior year for the State Department. That's three months less uh, of your 12 month service agreement. And, and that's fantastic because also it's helping you get your foot in the door in the federal government. Uh, there are a lot of entry level um, positions uh, in the various agencies that of course, uh, most born will be starting their career path on. Uh, and then talking about how you will transition from, um, you know, from those entry level positions, those internships and trying to get into uh, learning more skills and abilities that will allow you to get into deeper parts of the federal government or find your way to areas where you do want to work uh, and, and talk about those long term career plans and the continued uh, uh, relevance of your born funded study to these career plans and and what your ultimate goals are and if you are interested in a career in federal government great and it's going to look fine if your interest is in academia and you want to be a professor down the road the goal is not just to say you know i'm going to do my 12 months in the federal government and get out what the committee really wants to see is how is this a natural progression how is working for the federal government you're born and then working for the federal government and then going on to get your PhD perhaps and, and teaching. Um, how is that part of a path that makes sense versus a off road, right? You're taking the off ramp to do your boring and your federal service. And then you're going back to what you really wanna do is teaching. That kind of argument doesn't look good. What the committee wants to see is that it's natural that you're, this experience in the federal government is going to help you be a better professor. So you're going to have to make that kind of argument. Uh, the do's and don'ts for SA2, definitely you want to demonstrate enthusiasm for uh, uh, federal career work. Um, 
obviously you do not want to make it sound like a burden. Okay, I have to do 12 months, so this is what I'll do, and then I'm going to get out as soon as I can. Uh, it's not going to be very competitive. Uh, you want to use examples, of, of course, of your maturity and leadership quality. So even if you've never been overseas before, talking about maybe you're, you're the president or vice president of your, um, you know, uh, East Asia Club, your uh, you know Habitat for Humanity, your volunteer work, things like that. Uh, maybe you've traveled. Maybe you are from a small town in Iowa, and now you're going to University of Miami, and and you need to make, uh, you know, that transition was difficult. Uh, or the opposite, you're from D.C. like I am, and and you went to uh, Gainesville, Florida, to study at University of Florida, and 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 that transition was difficult you know it depends there are a lot of ways you can do this uh and then of course some of you have been overseas before um maybe you were a graduate student you did an undergraduate study abroad or you were a jet or you did peace corps already whatever it is these are things that you can talk about in your application uh and then don't treat the federal career as i said as an afterthought it's something to do because you have to to get the funding um and don't focus on your resume uh, and uh, don't be so specific that it sounds like, you know what, I'm going to be a foreign service officer. Uh, I'm going to do this career path and I will absolutely uh, get this job and I will not even consider not getting it. Uh, if you seem so rigid with it, whatever job it is, uh, you really want to add in some backup. Like, you know, while I'm looking for, you know, while I'm attempting to get into the Foreign Service, I will also be looking at opportunities within State Department and here, here, and here. Uh, and, and what you're doing is showing a flexibility, flexibility and feasibility, two of our biggest um, keywords on your born application. I'm flexible enough that, uh, and, and it's feasible enough that I can do these things. Uh, I want to be the ambassador of, you know, Japan. Is that feasible? Probably not. I want to be a lifelong diplomat. Is that feasible? Probably. So these are the things that we look for. Uh, study plan summary. This is going to be where you talk about the exact program that you're doing. Uh, the basic structure of the program, how many hours per week, the ex extracurricular and linguistic cultural activities. For example, are you going to have speaking partners? Are you going to live with a homestay family? Are you going to be, uh, if not that, are you going to have a local student, somebody from the country you're, you're traveling to as your roommate? Things like that look great to the committee. Volunteer work. Um, you know, getting yourself in, in the community, not, not, you know, if you mention only what you're doing in the classroom, the committee is left to think you're going to be huddled in your apartment uh, or dorm uh, in between classes, and, and that's not doing any good. Boren is not just language. It's not just working for the federal government. We put right in the middle of our logo, which is on my chest, boom, boom, uh, language, culture, service. So this is important. Um, let's see. The letters of recommendation. Now, we only require two from undergrads, and I get this question all the time. I say, what if I only can get two? Does it look bad? I'd rather you send me two letters of recommendation uh, that are strong than give me two strong letters of recommendation and find kind of a weak one. Uh, so we want to avoid that. You don't want to leave a bad taste in the reviewer's mouth. So you want to say, okay, I have two strong ones. I'm going to stick with that. Uh, letter from your academic advisor. If you're taking the language currently, uh, you do want a letter of language, um, a, uh, a language proficiency. It is not needed if you've never taken the language before. It is not needed if you don't have access to a language professor. Uh, but if you do, if you're taking Portuguese right now and you have a Portuguese classes in your in your transcript and the committee doesn't have a language proficiency evaluation from your Portuguese teacher, that's going to look weird, right? They're going to be like, oh, what's going on there? So if you have, if you are taking, applying for a program, a language that you're currently studying, have that language proficiency. A language proficiency or a language professor could do both a proficiency evaluation and a letter of recommendation. Uh, you'll have to send them two different requests. The It's all from the same part of the application. But uh, again, they should know who you are, obviously. Uh, I recommend them reading your essays. 
so that they know what it is born is so they don't say dear fulbright committee i like this student i hope he gets your job uh you know we, they should know what you're getting into uh they should know the feasibility of the program they're going to talk to your maturity they're going to talk to the, your flexibility and your and your your tolerance for others and things like that but um the key and we put this on our social media uh born awards everywhere uh instagram twitter facebook uh if, if i don't think we're allowed to use TikTok, but the idea is get those letter of recommendation requests in before winter break winter is coming um if you're watching this in january get get on it now because the that is one of the things that is beyond your control you send the request through the system double check with the letter writers to make sure that they got that email because sometimes it goes to spam valhalla uh and we really want to make sure that they get that in on time uh good i think and for fellows again you need three letters um an academics are important but they're not all important you can have three academics if you wish if you have professional experience um if you're an undergrad or graduate that has worked for the federal government as an intern or as an employee definitely if you have somebody friendly um, who is your supervisor get them to write a letter do not get co-workers family members no matter how germane or relevant you feel it is it's never a good look when your aunt writes a letter or your mom writes a letter uh even if your mom is dr biden you know you want to make sure that uh no avoid family members things things to avoid we get that every year i shouldn't have to say that but we get that every year um abstract methodology okay this is for the boring fellows if you're doing a research component we do ask you for a 300 word um idea of what that is the good news of this uh before we had this uh, boring fellows had to shove this into one of their other essays this allows you to put in information that otherwise would take out room valuable room to talk about your career plans um use a standard research abstract format um, it does not need to be uh, identical to your essay one uh, of course uh, but it should you know complement essay one and essay two it should have basically you should be showing the committee that this is something that is relevant to what you're doing um, and and relevant to what you want to do in the future uh, what you want to avoid in a born fellow as a born fellow is coming up with a plan that seems so uh time consuming that this committee worries you won't have time to actually uh you know actually do the language component now good news is if you are at an inter intermediate or advanced level of the language and the the research you're doing is in the target language that counts as language study under boring but if you're going to China or you're going to Taiwan or Singapore for the first time and your Mandarin is at beginner levels, maybe you have one semester or zero and you're doing all this research, the committee is going to be like, are you kidding me? Are, are you really applying for a language program? But I think you're a Fulbright applicant disguised as a born applicant. And that's the last thing you want. Lead with language this and make sure that uh, I would emphasize that you will have time to do this and your language study uh, in your application if you have a research advisor they should be one of your letters of rec recommendation as well i think that's a good a good call that was a lot appreciate you hanging in there with me the deadline is february 1st 2023 for uh undergrads 5 p.m eastern 99 percent of you will wait until february 1st 459 to hit submit so be careful um Again, save progress while you're writing these essays. Uh, the graduate students, January 25th, a week earlier, is when your deadline is. Uh, 5 p.m. Eastern, again, is when you need to hit submit. Once you hit submit, you will no longer have access to your application, so remember that. Make sure your campus advisor, if you have one, has looked at your application before you hit submit. Uh, the letters of recommendation can be submitted after you hit submit. So once you hit submit, it doesn't block your letters um you will be able to see in the application whether or not your letters have been submitted you should get an email but again it's generated automatically so these things go to spam all the time be aware check your junk mail folder uh your program can't start before june 3rd 2023 because we have a mandatory uh in-person orientation in washington dc we pay for it doesn't come out of your award but you have to be there 
Uh, so if you are applying for a early start, uh, early summer program, be aware that it should start sometime after June 3rd. Uh, and you can start as late as March 1st, 2024. Most borings start somewhere between summer and fall, uh, and it's about 92% study somewhere between summer and fall. This is a great year to apply. If, I, if you're still here, I feel like you're going to apply. I think the numbers are in your favor this year. We are still crawling out of COVID, so you will have one of the higher percentage of success uh, than most uh, most years. I think most years we get around 22 to 23% success rate on our undergrad award, and it's even higher for the graduate students. Uh, I bet we're much higher than that um, because we'll have fewer applications. Uh, so this is the time, don't wait. Apply. Contact us if you need. Uh, if you have questions, this is our contact information. If you haven't already talked to your campus rep, you can zap this, and it will take you to our website where you can type in your school's name. Uh, in the application, if you can't find your school, often it's because you have a school like University of Texas or University A and T. This and that. The system is very persnickety. Uh, if you can't find it, send me an email. More than likely, you just have to put either spaces or no spaces between the A, the amber stamp, and the T. It gets really weird. That's on our application. Uh, any application issues, email us. Don't leave it. Don't just say, well, I couldn't get it to work. It's probably not you. It's probably us. Let us look into it. Boren at IIE.org. Uh, if you call that 800 number, hit one, and you'll get to us. And that's it. Thank you very much, guys, for uh, joining us today. I hope, uh, uh, geez, I really encourage you to look at our other webinars. We're going to put out a final touches uh, webinar soon. You can find our older 2022-2021 webinars. Basics, basic information um, uh, is there as well, just different due dates. Uh, if you're very curious, I'll be putting most, we'll have an alumni webinar coming up in in January as well. They'll give you an opportunity in person to ask Born have already gone through this process and came out the other side uh, questions. But thank you very much. And I look forward to hopefully seeing some of you at orientation in Washington, D.C., June 1st.